What does the Dead Space remake hide off camera in the first chapter? The USG Ishimura is full of jump scares and other startling encounters. But in today's video, we're going to take a look behind the scenes so you can see how all these things work from a game developer's point of view. From a crash landing to surprise filled vents, there's a lot to cover. So I hope you enjoy this look behind the scenes of the Dead Space remake. But before we begin, I want to let you know that I'll also be breaking fantasy games over on my new channel Shield Scuff. From Skyrim to Elden Ring, Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, and much, much more. The same horoscope content you love, just not on horror games. So if you want to check that out, there's a link in the description. As always, I'd like to start things off with a very brief recap of what we'll be covering. So we start off in space, and we eventually make a very rough landing into the dock area of the USG Ishimura, the large spaceship we spend the majority of the game in. We then wander inside and get ambushed, and at this moment our team members get assaulted and we run from necromorphs to an elevator. We get our weapon of choice, head deeper into this chaotic facility, and then need to repair slash replace a tram car. We snag a data board, fix what needs to be fixed, and make our way back to our ship the Kellyan. Unfortunately, the ship blows up, and with that goes our hopes of leaving. We then must head to the medical bay and find the deceased captain's rig, and once we find him, the chapter ends. But now let's rewind time and go back to the beginning. So one of the first things you see upon booting up the game is the title screen. And the title screen in Dead Space works in a very neat way, because the moment the title screen is up, the game world is actually running behind the scenes. It preemptively loads your latest save data and populates the world around it. However, if you're booting the game up for the first time, there's something a bit different. Because you have no previous save, so if we were to check behind the scenes, we'll actually find ourselves on the Kellyan with a crew all around us. So here is Isaac, fully suited up and standing, and behind us we have all the crew members stuck in an A pose. So this is another modeling pose similar to the iconic T pose, but in this instance the arms are sort of at an angle, which makes it look more like an A. But until we actually start the game, these characters are all here in the center of the map, and they do not take to their positions until we actually start. And speaking of starting, when we actually play the game, we're sitting in the seat and we're flying through space. But the way this is pulled off is that the ship itself isn't actually moving. It's just the environment moving around the ship. And you can see how they have this warp speed effect that consumes the front window, making it look like we're shooting through space very, very fast. But in reality, this is actually just a funnel that is tapered over the edges of the window that simulates that fast movement. So this is a trick that's been used for a very long time in video games and even movies and all sorts of stuff. But it's a very simple effect and it's very effective. Now that's something that I currently cannot identify is off to the left of the map from where Isaac is sitting, way out in space is this odd green square. And like I said, I'm not entirely sure why this is here. It is a flat green square, and of course the player will never see this, but the same green square actually does exist in the Ishimura as well. If any of you game devs out there know what it is, drop a comment down below because I'm curious. From here, all we have to look forward to is absolute chaos, so the ship comes crashing in into an emergency landing, and this is what it looks like from the perspective of outside the ship. So you know, it's a bit rough around the edges, but from the player's perspective, they'll never see this. And also from the player's point of view inside the ship, it just looks incredible. So nothing out here really matters, honestly. So upon surviving this ordeal, um, the first thing I wanted to check out was actually Isaac himself. And what's interesting is that Isaac's body, as you imagine, is rigged for death. So if we take the camera inside of Isaac, you'll see all of his pieces and parts that are used if we meet an untimely end. And this makes sense, you might as well carry around all the stuff with you so that if a death animation occurs, no loading has to take place. It just simply plays out with the already loaded model. But basically, we're chopped up meat stored in a skin suit. So yeah, that's pleasant. And speaking of this suit, there's actually an oversight by the developers on it. And I call this an oversight specifically because it's something that was probably put in as a placeholder, but was never fixed because they assumed the player would never be able to see it. But Isaac's display rig, that's actually centered around his chest, does have the lorem ipsum placeholder text. So this is copy and paste dummy text that graphic designers and web designers and all sorts of artists typically use to see how text will fill a space in a specific design. Now, as someone who used to do a lot of web design, this is something that I've used very, very often. But possibly from the game dev's perspective, they didn't swap it out because the in-game camera usually makes this a bit blurry and you can't read it. However, what they possibly didn't account for was when you get near a wall, your camera is forced out of its normal perspective and gets closer to the player. And with this, you can actually read that text on the display. 
So obviously, this is not a big deal. It's just interesting that it's here. So as we make our way deeper into this facility, we eventually come across this room where quite a lot happens. Our crew gets ambushed here, and this is where the true terror of Dead Space sets in. So we go into this small separate room and activate this computer, and our team on the other side gets ambushed. Now the first necromorph that appears actually comes out of a vent right in front of the player. But these necromorphs actually appear in game the second we activate that computer. And if we look up into the ceiling vent, we can actually see that necromorph just laying there waiting to be activated. Above these vents is a small blacked out room, and that is where this necromorph is just hanging out. So upon activation, this necromorph actually clips through the fan, which is kind of interesting. And when he's about halfway through, then the vent explodes, destroying the fan. And when he's defeated after getting shot at, he then retreats backwards into this vent. Now the small square boxes above this room aren't the only ventilation areas in this place, because there's also some beneath the floor. However, the second necromorph enters this room from the floor in a very interesting way. So again, as soon as the player activates that computer, this necromorph beneath the floor also appears. And he's just waiting beneath the floor in this crouch position to come out of it. But what's kind of funny is he comes out of the floor without destroying the vent. He basically rises up and oozes through the floor and then attacks our teammate. And I find it very interesting that they did not animate this floor breaking apart. You would think that the logic was, well, if the player cannot see this, why animate the destruction of it? And that makes sense to some degree because from a point of view in the window, this area is sort of cropped out. But the problem is that's actually not true. Because if we stand at this computer and simply rotate our camera in game, we can actually see this necromorph come out of the ground without modifying the game. So it's kind of funny looking. Now in the back of the room, the necromorphs enter this area from the ceiling in a very similar way. They just clip through the ceiling as our fellow crew runs into this room back here. And when our fellow story characters make it into this room, they unload and leave the objects that they are carrying behind. And now we are all alone. Now there is a necromorph that explodes out of a wall vent right next to us, but watching this in slow motion is actually kind of cool. You can see the necromorph basically explode out of the vent and sort of stumble to the floor in slow motion. But it's interesting to watch this in bullet time. And now we do a mad sprint down the hallway, hoping we do not get attacked, and we make it to an elevator. And there's a very iconic jump scare that happens in this elevator, as a necromorph pries open the door and tries to get us. But the way this is pulled off is actually kind of neat. So none of the necromorphs in the hallway that were chasing you down ever make it to the elevator. The second you open those doors, all those necromorphs who are chasing you unload. So it is not one of those necromorphs coming to you at the elevator to open it. But what happens instead is that out of view from the player, behind the elevator door, a necromorph just appears there. And from the player's perspective in the elevator, they would never be able to see something directly behind that door. So they just load this guy in and let him do his jump scare, and he lives a very short life. Now, down the elevator, after we get our weapon, we eventually come across a dude who is screaming in the hallway. And before we open this door, this person doesn't actually exist on the map. But the second we activate this door, we can see him appear in his default modeling pose, the A pose, before he gets warped from that position to right next to the door with a necromorph on top of him. If we slow down the footage a bit, you can see that he appears there just for a split second. And as we continue down this hallway, we eventually come to another encounter that has like a brief jump scare. Well, I guess it's more so like a loud noise, but we come across this blocked up entryway and we can see a necromorph run across in front of us while screaming. And if we view this from a different angle, the necromorph appears and then disappears once they're out of view, as most of you probably expected. So when we meet up with Bridget and Anthony and get the latest report on what we need to do next, these two are decently far away in an area we cannot access. And because of this, I was curious where they went. So I decided to follow them with a camera as they started walking out of the room. And the area they're walking into actually does not exist. They simply walk into a small room and then just clip through the wall. Now, right before we get our stasis ability, which allows us to slow things down, we come across this tram car that is above us that has a body in it. But as we walk down this ramp, there is a loud noise and this body falls out of the tram car, almost like it was pushed, and it collides with the railing down below. So of course, this makes you think, oh, did a necromorph do this? Did it just push that body out of that car? Is it gonna jump down and attack me? Well, no actually. Because in reality, the body is always standing up near the edge of the car, just waiting to activate the moment the player starts descending the ramp towards the bottom. And as you can see, nothing actually pushes it out of the car. 
Now after this, there honestly isn't too many interesting things for a bit of the game. However, there is an extra copy of the tram car located beneath the map in the area where the body fell. It's down here completely in shadow, and the only way we can see it is if we use the light above us to illuminate the edges of where the tram car is at. So after a bit of fast forwarding through the chapter, we eventually come back to our ship. And the hope is that we'll be able to use it to escape at some point. So as we stroll in, we are instructed to activate this computer off to the right. And doing so shows this report where the core of the ship is actually under attack. So of course, this makes us freak out, and now Haley gets attacked by a necromorph, and because the core of the ship is completely screwed, the ship explodes, and Haley basically rolls a one and dies on the spot as we get ejected out of a ride. It then crashes to the ground. But let's play that back in slow motion to see what's happening. So as soon as we finish the cutscene with the core getting destroyed, a necromorph spawns in the back of the room where the explosion eventually comes from. And this necromorph is just standing there in an idle pose waiting for Haley to run back to it. So apparently the explosion gets triggered right away if we approach Haley while she's in combat. So if we sit back and slow the game down, she will just completely unload in this necromorph over and over again. Watching this in slow motion is kind of neat, but eventually the necromorph just T-poses in dominance and then uses instant transmission to teleport out of the ship before it explodes. Haley keeps shooting for, uh, quite a while though. However, apparently she is hitting something because there's some floating blood, but then the explosion finally occurs and she rockets backwards. And despite the game speed being slowed down, Isaac launches out of the window. Normally a flash occurs that obscures the window, but it actually looks like the window doesn't break at all when Isaac goes through it. Inside the ship, Haley has unloaded, and only our weapon remains as a lot of debris begins to float upwards. Now, viewing the ship's collapse from a different angle shows that it clips through a bunch of objects and other things. All of this is off camera though, and from Isaac's point of view, the player's point of view, it's terrifying and extremely well done, especially since you're already in the sights of the enemy again. So from here, we end up going back inside, but there's some stuff hidden out of bounds. For one, there's a pair of dual weapons floating behind a wall, and as we look around further out of bounds, we can find a giant appendage. For those of you who beat the game already, maybe you recognize these things. As we make our way to the end of the chapter, we come across the in-game store and upgrade station, which allows Isaac to swap armors. Now when Isaac swaps armors, he steps behind a metal doorway as a ton of blinding light is emitted through the crack. He then steps out, fully suited up. And as you probably guessed, watching this from behind the door, we can see these four energy beams shooting at Isaac, as the new outfit swaps out instantly with the old. And with this, we press on just a bit further, and chapter one comes to a close. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed this look behind the scenes, subscribe if you did, and I'll see all of you again real soon on Horoscoped. Cheers!